Hi, this is Ernie Hudson from Ghostbusters. I'm wearing my Winston Zedmore jumpsuit from the movie. I have two pieces of advice. Don't go out there. And who are you going to call? In a world where zombies, ghosts, serial killers, and vampires all exist, it's Nico, Brian, Mike, and Dustin. And they are all that stand between you and the films that could end the world. Welcome to the Don't Go Out There Horror Movie Podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to the Don't Go Out There Horror Movie Podcast. Just want to thank all of our fans and listeners. Really appreciate the support. You guys are awesome. Before we get into tonight's film review, just want to give a quick shout-out to our website, don'tgooutthere.com. Everything about our podcast is on the website. All of our episodes and interviews, if you want to check those out, We've done some incredible interviews in the past. Go check them out there in a specific tab by themselves so you don't have to scroll through hundreds of episodes on Apple or Spotify, etc. We also have our store if you want to grab a shirt, a mouse pad, a hat, all that good stuff. We'd love to see your pictures, you know, rep your favorite podcast. And Chan's Etsy page is also attached if you want to grab a Tumblr. All of our social media links are on there as well. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. Like us, subscribe us, follow us, all that good stuff. And the last thing I want to shout out on our website is our patreon we call it blood donors uh we know we have the traditional monthly reoccurring kind if you want to support us help us pay the bills as we say or if you want if there's a movie you want us to review that option is available as well uh just check out our website don't go out there.com also if you haven't noticed we've recently joined the believe network so there's some ads on our program now but if you want ad free content Go check us out on Blood Donors. The ad-free episodes will be available there. We appreciate your support. We hope you enjoy the episode. All right, guys. Welcome to the film review. This is a special one. I know Brian's hold this one near to his heart. I'm just going to say this is part A or one half of his birthday picks. Uh, Brian, you want to announce your pick for this week and why you picked it? Yeah, I wanted to do this for my birthday pick, but then I came up with a pretty good idea for a bonus episode. So I kind of switched things around, went a free month just because I really wanted to pick this movie. We've done the other three in the franchise. First, uh, 2024's Ghostbusters, Frozen Empire. Hell yeah. All right, so I dread doing Ghostbusters movies on this show. Not that I just think they're god awful, but the last thing I ever want to do is disappoint my brother Brian. And I hate to admit, I think, I think this is the weakest one we've done so far. Um, just story wise, character wise, there's there's just too much going on for me. There's a lot going on, and I don't think the film has the charm that the original two Ghostbusters had, uh, except when the OG cast members are on screen. Phoebe McKenna Grace is really the only new character that I even enjoyed in this one, and they still gave her like a, kind of a weird plot at the end that just or like a weird twist. Like it just didn't work for me, but I like the. Second Ghostbusters a lot. I gave it a 9.5. I'm going to rewatch, I promise to you two, the OG again, just so I can give it another fair shot. Because there's really no reason I should like the second one as much as I did and not the first one, right? Like, I feel like right. I, that's a, I feel like it's a very hot take to like the second one way more than the first one. But I don't know. Kumal and Johnny, like his character just annoyed the ever-loving hell out of me in this movie. Oh. <laughs> He's so out of place. His, his comedy kills scenes for me. And, uh, there's a TikTok guy that I'm sure Dustin knows. I can't remember his name, but he's a black guy who reviews movies. He's real. He, they call him Unk. But he gave the movie a 3 out of 10. I'm not going to go that low, but I personally feel like this movie is just kind of a mess. But it's still well made. I believe it. it is well made, but I think there's just it's kind of a mess to me. Dustin, go ahead. By the way, it's I offensive can't. that you said that Dustin would know the TikTok guy. Why would you think that I would know the TikTok guy? Because I'm old? Because you don't, don't use the Tic Tacs. I don't know that guy. <laughs> I, I can't go next. I'm fucking, I'm dumbfounded right now. Yeah, Kamel Nanjani fucking stole the show. I love him. I said it on an instant reaction that Brian and I did. I've been a fan of his since uh, I saw him, the first time I saw him was in Silicon Valley. And I fucking love him. I think his comedic timing is perfect. His line delivery is perfect. And to me, he's believable. Like, he's just a guy. He's not a Ghostbuster. And so... Yeah, he would be this awkward, nerdy, funny guy in this movie. Uh, anyway, the uh, I'll just save a lot of it. I, th I think that this movie was highly enjoyable. Um, I like it a lot. It's I don't remember, Brian, when we did the instant reaction, you asked me at the end if I had to rank the four movies, excluding 2016, if I had to rank them, where would I put this one? I think I had this one third. 
I think I went original Afterlife, yeah, this one, you and then Ghostbusters 2. But I said there's not a bad film in the franchise, and I stand by that. As far as where I'd rank it, if you ask me today with another watch of it, I don't know, man. I might have this one second. And it's because Kamel Nanjani. He's fucking great. <laughs> but also, I said it then, and I'll say it now, and I will say it until I'm blue in the face or until she proves me wrong. McKenna Grace is a budding star. Oh, she yeah. is so fucking good. Yeah. And I really like the story we got. Like, Nico, you said you didn't really care for the story in this one. To me, I, I thought the story was great because it's a coming of age. It's about Trevor. I'm a man. Stop treating me like a baby. Like I'm an adult. It's about Phoebe. I'm the best Ghostbuster here. I don't care if I'm 15. I don't care. You know, you don't tell me I'm too young. It's about her coming into her own. It's about Trevor wanting to prove that he's a man. It's about the family becoming a family. Paul Rudd's character stepping into this stepfather role and questioning because that's a very real situation that a lot of guys have to deal with. Right. What are my bounds? I don't want to overstep. And then just coming in to come to grips with and come to terms with that. I think there's a lot enough callbacks to the original two to where that really works. And not just the original two, but the real Ghostbusters, which I know Brian has a lot on. I, I loved it. I loved it. Unapologetically, I loved it. So whoever Unk is on TikTok, I'm not familiar with him, but him <laughs> and you can kiss the fattest, whitest part of my ass because you're both wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me ask you a serious question. Just serious discussion. If you took Trevor's character out of this movie, how much does it change? None. I mean, that's every not single true. every single character though doesn't have to be the the lead. They're called, like, it's every called single the ghost, person doesn't have to be integral. It's called the Ghostbusters, not the Ghostbuster. No, I get that, but I feel like Trevor's character just he's very forgettable. Like I like Finn Wolfhard, obviously. <laughs> but like even in season four of Stranger Things, if you took him completely out, I don't think you miss anything. And I don't think if you oh. take him out of this one, you miss so anything with him gone. So you're just shitting like, on well, Finn Wolfhard. Okay. No, I like Finn well, Wolfhard. I just don't and then like, like throughout, don't. and then throughout the movie it's like Paul Rudd goes from like one he's he's one way and, and Callie, they're like trying to be parents, but then then they want to be, you know, playful. Then they want to bring her back in the family. It's like, I don't feel like they knew what direction they wanted to take with the new cast members and the old cast members. It, kind of like how y'all mentioned with uh, Scream 5. It's like Radio Silence did a really good job of balancing everything. I don't think they balanced all the new and the old well this one, personally. But I'm also not the diehard like you guys are. I'm big time disagree with that. The, the, the fact of the matter is, is the people who are diehard Ghostbusters fan like the movie. That's what's important. Uh, I mean, not a lot of them. Like, it's kind of split, to be honest with you. But yeah, and I don't think that they ain't on this show, though. <laughs> that's true. Oh, we'll you're talking about the diehards on the show love to me. Okay, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I just, you know, Nico, I knew going into this recording that you weren't the biggest fan of it because uh, you, you texted me about it when you watched it, and you didn't shit on it. Well, you, you asked like, me you, like as soon as I said scene by scene and stuff. He's like, "Did you like it?" I was like, eh, "Yeah, what, it was my least favorite of the four so far." Yeah. And so I knew that coming in, but I'm not going to sit here and act like I'm not completely taken aback <laughs> that you didn't appreciate Kamel Nanjani. Like, I fucking love that guy. Oh, God. Okay. His, his, oh. his one-liners, just, I don't know, they, they killed the scenes for me. Like, you get that really tense scene at the end with the Garaka, and he's like, free, he gets stuck on the pole. I did not like corny that. Line. That's the one thing that I didn't like. Was him More corny lines trying to, like, barter with him. It's like, get this guy out of here. No. It's funny. It's funny. <laughs> it, you tell Louis, me it, he's Lewis Tully. Imagine this. Like, uh, he's Lewis he Tully. Yeah. And I was gonna, I was gonna wait for you to say that because you said it in the in the uh, instant reaction we did, and I knew you probably had it in your notes. But yeah, he's the Lewis Tully of this movie. And think about this: if you're just a guy who's unassuming and you know you're not a main character in anyone's story, not even your own. That's how I view his character in this movie, Nadine. Uh, Imagine being face to face with a fucking ghost. You're not going to know how to. You're going to be awkward. So I've talked it up. I don't expect him to come in and just be, you know, uh, the the badass that saves the day. I expect him to be awkward and funny and not know how to deal with it. So he's trying to cope with humor. <sighs> okay, well, I get that. But I don't know. It's just I don't know. <laughs> I know when well, it hits, right. it hits. When it doesn't, it doesn't. Yeah, you know, no doubt. 
Um, first of all, look, if you've already listened and Dustin brought it up, if you've already listened to mine and Dustin's instant reaction on this, bear with me. Cause I, I mean, I can speak for myself in saying that I'm probably going to repeat a lot of the same things because I mean, shit sidebar, you know, I really re listened to that. I think either yesterday, or the day before yesterday, and that was a very deep dive <laughs> given that it was only an instant reaction. So when I mean, we talked, and, uh, we talked a lot. <laughs> we did. And you saw it twice going into that. That was my first viewing. Mm -hmm. I just want to pat myself on the back for remembering that much about a movie with no yeah. notes and just. <laughs> it must have made yeah, an impression. A, must have made an impression. It, it did. But so anyway, just to repeat the same story I told there, this was my most anticipated movie of the year. So. So much that I honestly, like I said, then I built it up so much in my head via, you know, trailers, which again, I give Dustin credit for not watching trailers now for sure. Um, but I built it up so much that I created this movie in my head based on those trailers, which have a ton of scenes, by the way, that didn't make the final cut of the movie. So when I didn't get the movie that I had envisioned and pieced together in my head, I walked out of the theater like and I texted you guys. I was like, did I like that? You know, I think I had it in maybe like the, the seven range, I believe, when I first watched it. But two days later, I went in with a clear head and was really able to just sit down and enjoy this. And I did just that. And I love this entry now. And honestly, I do every single time. I like it more every time I watch it. It just gets better and better. It reminds me a ton, like you mentioned, of the real Ghostbusters cartoon, which I loved as a kid. And yeah, I think there are a ton of characters in this, just like you said, Nico. But to me... Jason Reitman and first-time director Gil Keenan, I think, wrote great plot lines for every single one of them. Every one of them get their time to shine. You know, and even the additions of, of some of these new guys, I thought were all done fantastic. I mean, this was, like you said, it was a movie for Ghostbusters fans made by Ghostbusters fans and fans of the franchise. And I think also it was a good one to kind of rope in some newer fans. And I've seen a lot of statistics on that, where there has been a lot of uptick on the old Ghostbusters movies being downloaded and watched on a lot of these uh, streaming channels and that because of these new ones coming out. And I thought it was a great entry into the lore. It's like, let's say, uh, Jamie Kennedy, let's say in, in Scream 2, for instance. Like, it, it, you know, you don't get this... It's not as integral to the plot line as he was in Scream 1, but it's somebody that you've built a rapport with, you know, you love, he's he's in your heart as part of your family already from, from the franchise. And so giving them something meaningful to do, to me, you know, there's only one or two major protagonists in a movie. So to have a movie with eight or nine and trying to give everybody equal footing, I don't think works. And But I think the way that they did it here does. Yep, I agree. Just a heads up, I'm probably going to talk a lot during this review, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> Brother, I got 2,641 words in this scene by scene, and I am uh, Lord Beer Me Strength or whatever that is in that flask of <laughs> Beer Me Strength. <clears throat> All right. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great. And would suffice. Robert Frost. That was a bar. Great quote. New York 1904. We see firemen from FDNY enter the Manhattan Adventure Society frantically. A fireman puts his hand on the door and his hand freezes to it. They break into the room and see everyone and everything frozen. They hear an ancient language chanted over the speaker and approach a person covered in armor sitting holding a brass orb. His eyes open, jump scaring the fireman and the brass orb moves. We see two blue eyes as we get title card and see the ectomobile weaving through New York traffic. The car is having mechanical issues as Phoebe tells science jokes. They forbid her from using the gunner seat as the Hell's Kitchen sewer dragon emerges from below. She disobeys her mom saying, I have a ghost to bust and shoots it, catching it by the tail. Trevor drops the RC car and chases after the ghost. The cops let the Ghostbusters handle it. The ghost gets out of range for the RC car, so Callie sends the drone after it. She traps the dragon and the family celebrates until Gary has to swerve through traffic, eventually crashing into several parked bikes. The news reports on the incident and they question who will pay for the mess. The crew meets with the mayor who is scolding them for what they did. He forbids Phoebe, who is 15, from being a ghostbuster. Gary defends her, but the mayor asks his relationship to her and adds more violations to the cause. He says he wants to turn the firehouse into a pile of bricks. Phoebe is annoyed she can't be a ghostbuster as Gary whips up some tacos. She says he's ta she's taking this to the labor board. She continues questioning her mom and Gary on not being able to be a ghostbuster. Callie gives Gary permission to be an asshole to the kids. Gary puts the ghost into the vault, but they struggle to close off the trap. The light turns green, but it flickers. 
Ray and podcast record their show, Repossessed, where Ray measures spiritual energy in guest objects. Ray examines an old lady's ex-husband's watch, but no spirit detected. Podcast crushes it with the hammer, and they yell out, next, with no remorse. All right, Brian's opening set of scenes, what do you think? Uh, I think a lot. Look, right off the bat, I love this cold open in 1904. I absolutely love the look that they went with. Uh, The effects in this movie, I think, are absolutely amazing. You know, I don't know if I'm spoiling it with anything, but Mike's not here and we didn't talk about it. But the budget was $100 and the effects had to get most of that because, I mean, they look Mm -hmm. fantastic. All the props in the world to REN effects and the whole team there. You know, and we pick up... With the uh, right with the Elmer Bernstein soundtrack from the '84 movie here, very recognizable. Same thing they did in the last movie in Afterlife. Love to hear it, but not two minutes into the movie, and we have a broken off hand by itself. Like it gives off a lot more creepy vibes than any of the other ones have, honestly, in my opinion. And it does go a little bit goofy in some ways too. So it kind of goes to both extremes a little bit more than the other movies. Now, my first my first nitpick here. As we bust into the logo and the title card, huge missed opportunity there by not playing the Ray Parker Jr. Ghostbusters theme. Very bad call there not to use it. I've actually seen it dubbed in on YouTube where people, you know, put it on there and overlaid it because I'm not the only one with that complaint. And my God, it's perfect. It's almost like it was meant to be there. So I don't know what they were thinking there not using that. Love to see the Spengler family again. Everyone I feel like just picks up right back into their roles from the last movie here. McKenna Grace, star of this movie. Dustin, you brought it up. You know, this is very much a Phoebe, Phoebe Spengler movie. And I feel like and it's a fantastic choice because that girl is one of my favorite actresses right now, too. Um, I love this first bust. You know, we have all these new upgrades to Ecto-1 with the drone and most of all, just some amazing shots that we've not seen in Ghostbusters movies before. You know, and being back in New York is just is just perfect for this movie. I did appreciate the last movie, like I said, going off uh, out of New York into the country, but I'm, I'm glad to be back. One of my favorite shots of this entire movie is that slow motion shot here as the ghost passes the window and you get that music cue as Phoebe says, it's the Hell's Kitchen sewer dragon. Like it felt very real Ghostbusters cartoonish and my God, I loved it. Showing the old commercials from the 80s on that newscast. I thought it was very Mm -hmm. nice touch as well. Kind of serving as a catching up to you if you hadn't seen the other ones for some reason. But my man, William Atherton, Walter freaking Peck, back from from the first one. You know, he was the one who worked at the EPA and made them basically blow a hole and release all the ghosts. You know, when he had to shut down everything in that first one, Nico, if you don't remember. But him being back as the mayor, still having it out for the Ghostbusters. Our fantastic move there. So quick little fun fact. The original movies used the hook and ladder eight in New York for the outer shots of the firehouse, but the inside was actually in a firehouse in Los Angeles. Well, the one in Los Angeles is, you know, like demolished now. So they actually built for the first time ever the entire firehouse inside and out on a sound stage in the UK, all floors for the first time. So as a Ghostbusters fan, seeing them go between floors like that, we've never seen that before. So this was all a, just a big treat for me. And just thank you for, for this J- Jason Reitman and just all of ghost corpse for doing that. Uh, so I like the open being set in 1904 and getting to see the firehouse before it was the Ghostbusters headquarter. I think that was really well done. Like you said, also the, the look of the frozen room is cool. Uh, People being frozen in motion down to the one guy who's leaning back in his chair and the hand being snapped off and continuing to rotate with the sonophone. Really cool. I think the visual effects in this movie are incredible. Very well done. Uh, Then we get up to present day and see our modern Ghostbusters in action. Great pacing. No wasted motion. Just right to it. Uh, Paul Rudd's comedic timing is as good as ever. He's great. Honestly, he's one of my favorite comedic actors. So really, really tip of the cap to him. Uh, I just recently rewatched the 40 year old virgin and laughed my ass off. Uh, I don't really care for the whole, it's the hell's angel or hell's kitchen, hell's kitchen sewer dragon bit though. Like it's, you know, I said this on the instant reaction we did, but it's like, we're supposed to be familiar with it. Like it's legendary. Could have just been a random ghost that they were like, Whoa, look at that thing. And it would have worked just fine. Adding fake lore to the ghost didn't do anything for me personally, because we'd never heard of it. Uh, yeah. But you made a, a good point. It did feel very much so like the, the real Ghostbusters. Um, I like the callbacks on the news report as well. The old movies, the old merch, the old commercials. That was fantastic. And then, uh, you know, when the mayor was berating them for damaging the city, 
I remember the thought of, I immediately thought of Detective Carter. That block was already messed up. Shout out to Rush Hour. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mentioned on the incident reaction as well, uh, but it really annoys me that the mayor is so anti Ghostbuster. Like I get that he hated them in the original movie. And so it's continuing that, but it's consistent, but it just doesn't make sense that he would have such a grudge because he's seen the damage that the ghosts do. Like he should know better than most how valuable the Ghostbusters are. I love the dynamic. Like I mentioned earlier, briefly between Gary and Callie. I think it's very realistic as far as a stepfather figure trying to figure out his role and, you know, what's appropriate. Also, yeah. his like, uh, uh, I'll be nice to you. I'll just be an asshole to your kids. That line was great. I laughed. <laughs> and then, you know, Ray and podcast relationships, very, uh, uh, it's another thing they nailed. Very compatible duo. Like they remind me of each other solo. So putting them together, that was great. And they had great chemistry throughout. Yeah. Uh, but I do know one thing. I would murder that little shithead if he just smashed my dead spouse's watch just for some <laughs> likes on TikTok or whatever. That watch wasn't possessed. Like he clearly said, the spirits moved on. There was no need to smash it. Damn youths. But overall, it's a very solid open and I'm heavily invested. So there's a little fun fact here, too, in this set of scenes. I thought maybe Dustin would say it, but when Gary says that he picked out a film for movie night, he holds up a VHS copy of Cannibal Girls. From 1973, that was actually the second feature film directed by Ivan Reitman, who yeah. obviously did the first two Ghostbuster films. He's also listed as producer on this one, which is dedicated to him. But the title Cannibal Girls can also be seen in the movie theater marquee in both Ghostbusters 2 and Ghostbusters Afterlife. Good shit. Um, I didn't have that. I, I knew I meant to put that in my notes. I didn't have it. So glad you did. All right. Phoebe makes it to the shop with samples. She and podcast take them downstairs and she tells them she's been benched. Phoebe finds all the little mini puffs Ray snuck back until Nadine enters the store to sell some weird old stuff. Nadine begins to haggle once he realizes Ray is intrigued by the brass orb covered in Arabic. He takes a reading with a PKE meter. Instant reaction. It begins to spark and a spirit flies directly to the ghost vault. Ray buys the lot from Nadine who says he has no change. Gary and Janine check out the damage and she says she'll tell Winston's engineers about it. Trevor fingers the hole in his ceiling leaking ooze and yells for his mom. She tells him he's an adult and to go handle it. He goes into the attic and hears rumblings under a pile of trash. A big green slimer emerges flying through him and into a wall. They get a call and leave Phoebe behind, who is furious. Ray continues to examine the brass orb and smiles, seeing the ectomobile drive past his shop. Phoebe sets up a game of chess in the park when suddenly the pieces begin to move on their own. The ghost of Melody appears, wondering why Phoebe isn't terrified of her. She tells her she died in a fire, and the two introduce themselves. Phoebe asks the best and worst parts of being a ghost until Melody wins again and disappears. Lars is at the firehouse listening and examining where the vault is. They look at the blueprints from Egon and they conclude they're running out of space. Winston shows them an article on an incident that could access the other side. Winston gives them a tour of the aquarium he's taken over that's now a paranormal research center. Trevor and Lucky hug each other as they see a collection of possessed items from Ray. Lars shows them the, how they extract the spirits from the objects and deposit them into the second chamber. Winston shows them the new containment unit based on Egon's own designs as Ray appears. They're told it could take three to seven years to move all the ghosts from the firehouse to here. Winston shows them the ghosts they have trapped and says they study them. All right, Brian, that's the next set of scenes. What do you think? I'm at the start of this. I'm so glad that we're back in Ray, Ray's occult books. You know, we saw it in Ghostbusters 2 for the first time and just briefly in the last one when Phoebe called Ray. But I love that we are back in it here and another Ghostbusters 2 Easter egg with the pink mood slime Phoebe is bringing in there. Also love to see Logan Kim back as podcast. You know, not as big of a role in this one. But again, I mean, there's a lot of people and he definitely, I feel like, gets his own time to shine in this one as well. I mean, it could have probably done without the mini puffs, in my opinion, uh, when they go downstairs. But I mean, eh, they're fine. I just wish it would have been either this or the puke ghost and not both of them. But I kind of mentioned that in our our uh, instant reaction. Uh, now, Kamal Nanjani. <laughs> wow. Easy for you to say. Holy shit. Uh, you said it, Dustin, and I, I completely agree. Steals this movie. And it's crazy. In a movie with Bill Murray, Paul Rudd, Dan Aykroyd, even Patton Oswald, and Kamal comes in and absolutely just fucking kills it. Um, this exchange with Aykroyd, who, I mean, shout out Aykroyd, 71 years old with a nice little chunk of screen time in this movie, and doesn't miss a fucking beat. 
But man, this exchange with him and Kamal, where he originally says thirty dollars for the whole lot, and then the spear goes off the yeah. PKE charts, and Ackroyd gives the whole spill, and then he goes sixty dollars. <laughs> like again, you can write that on paper, but Kamal's delivery it was just it was so good. I loved it. Kerry Coon, another who just to me slides right back into this role. That. And the writing was just perfect for her. I mean, she's the same exact parent we saw in the last one. Not even looking up from her phone, telling Finn, Finn Wolfhart's Trevor to, to figure it out himself because he's a man with, you know, the slime shit. Didn't miss a beat. And when Tre- Trevor goes to the attic, man, that's just a, it's just a fucking Trevor tre- treasure trove of, of Easter eggs up there. You have to watch it many times to see them all. I mean, we've got the original hand signed. Uh, handwritten sign from the first one leaning up against the window. We've got boxes mm-hmm. of flyers and balloons from the commercial they did in Ghostbusters 2. We've got all those thermal mugs, by the way, on this podcast. All four of us have those thermal mugs. But it was great to see Slimer again. I mean, the model, absolutely phenomenally done. I watched the behind the scenes and the links they went for it to look exactly like you did in the original movie. It was absolutely beautiful. I thought they did a great job. Um, Emily Alin Lind, who plays Melody, second time on this show, by the way. She was snaked by Andy in the amazing Dr. Sleep, which we reviewed. Don't go out there.com. Hmm. But okay. So there were a lot of complaints about this subplot between Melody and Phoebe. And maybe it sounds like Nico might be one of them. But I mean, I love it. You can take this relationship as a romantic relationship if you want to. But it was done obscure, obscurely on purpose. And honestly, I don't take it that way. I just take it as two girls who are, like you said, does uh, coming of age, both just really need a friend. And I think it's very well done. And last thing, and I'll shut up. I love the addition of the engineering department, how it's all headed up by Winston now, who, you know, we've said before, didn't get the love he deserved in the original two. Finally getting it now. You know, very cool seeing Lucky again. I, I kind of expect her to have a bigger role maybe in the next one if they do it, which I don't know if that's even been greenlit yet or not so but the addition of of uh james the uk's james Adcaster as lars full disclosure they actually had to cast a brit here to get the cost cut to actually film in the uk but a caster is absolutely fantastic here i think he definitely plays the other half of the egon role that's kind of i feel split up between phoebe and lars in this one yeah so first of all when podcast is talking on the phone to his parents I, I wanted to ask Nico what he was saying, but then again, Nico's from Kentucky, so I'm, I'm not going to do that. Uh, the, the mini Stay Puffs were were fun to me. Like they didn't linger on it too much, and it was just entertaining. Like it was very brief, and you know, I was fine with that. Then we meet my favorite new addition to the franchise, Kumail Nanjiani as Nadim. Like I said, he's hilarious to me. Uh, I'm all in favor of him getting more and more work, just because like him as an actor, I think he's 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 great. Uh, he was the best part of the movie to me, and his whole interaction with Ray is great. From his negotiation tactics to his acting like he knows what Ray's talking about, like it was, it was fantastic. I laughed. Uh, something I didn't pick up on the first time I watched the movie, but I caught it this time and I loved it. Was uh, when he walks out of Ray's shop, the flames behind him on the hot dog cart were going crazy. Yep. And I, I think that's great, subtle foreshadowing. Like, I didn't think anything of it on the first watch. It's like, oh, that hot dog stands on fire. So, you know, I just blew it off. I was going to say, I 100% did not catch that the first two times I watched this movie. It wasn't until, like, you know, you're looking for other stuff and I caught it. Yeah. So I completely yeah. am there with you. Absolutely. Uh, it's great to see Janine back. Hell yeah. And then speaking of great to see them back, Slimer. Hell <laughs> yes. He looked great. Great job on Slimer. Um, I think the story between Phoebe and Melody is solid. I like their dynamic. Melody is, of course, played by Emily Allen Lynn, who Brian mentioned we've seen in Dr. Nyquil. And she's also Whoa. in a cut. Co- <laughs> that wasn't the name. That wasn't the name of the movie. I think oh, that's what it was it. to me. No, Dr. Um, sleep. it was sleep. Dr. Sorry. Dr. Put me to sleep. Sorry. And then uh, nope. she's also in a couple of movies that I'm sure we're going to review someday. The Babysitter 1 and 2, uh, entertaining couple of movies there. Uh, I thought the research center was awesome. Really cool seeing what they're doing. And it looks cool as hell, but the technology they're using looks dated as hell. Like this movie takes place in modern times and the computer that they were using looked like the first computer that my family bought in the nineties. So I don't believe that Winston Zeddemore with all the unlimited resources he has, I don't think he'd have them using windows 95. So not, (laughs) not really a fan of that, but overall, this is another very solid set of scenes and spoiler alert. I love every set of scenes, so get used to that. 
You bring up a good point, but there is a like a it's a very thin line. I think when you go too futuristic with Ghostbusters or, you know, not futuristic, but modern age, like some of the charm, I guess, of it is the fact that they kind of use old shit and piece together old shit sometimes. So, but I I kind of totally get your point. All right. The Spanglers drive home and Gary backs the car into the firehouse. He asks Phoebe for help with the proton pack to have a sweet moment. He tries to comfort her and speaks on how fast time flies by. They get a call and Phoebe is visibly upset she can't join. She answers the phone from a customer desperately needing help. She gets dressed and has podcasts help her out. Lars and Lucky are working, and she puts the orb into the extraction machine. Something's not right as the orb begins to shake, fighting extraction. The machine powers down, and all the proton fields are down. Lars gets the proton fields back up, but drops the orb because of how cold it is. Phoebe and podcasts arrive at the restaurant to trap the ghost. Problem is, it's Melody. Phoebe freezes up as podcast says to shoot her. Melody gets away as she shoots, missing, and breaking the window. Phoebe puts her pack under her bed and opens her window to see Melody hovering outside. She tells her she missed on purpose. Melody enters the room and the two converse on advanced scientific terminology. Melody looks around the place and arrives at the vault. The two speak on what happens when we're all done here. Melody wants to join her family but can't. The matchbook is Melody's anchor to the world. Mama checks on Phoebe who says she'll be right up as Melody disappears. We hear the same ancient chants again as ice covers the ground heading towards the vault. The ice arrives at Melody in the street. She tells us she's going as fast as she can. Does it have to be her? All right, Brian, the next set of scenes. What do you think? Uh, I actually don't have a ton on this set, but I really do love this little subplot mission that we get here. I mean, first of all, with this little scene between Paul Rudd and McKenna, like where he's just struggling with where he fits into this family. Quick, very quick scene. But I love that subplot and very glad that they included it. And, but like, you know, like we've mentioned twice already so far, we do have a lot of threads going on here with, you know, podcasts and Phoebe going off on their own to bust Melody and Lars and Lucky moving the Garaka plot forward as well. Again, a lot, but to me, it keeps the movie interesting. It doesn't seem like it's overcrowded and too much. Uh, also really builds up tension factor with Garaka, you know, showing the other ghosts, being afraid of him. But, you know, going back to, to Melody and Phoebe, I buy all of this fascination with with death from Phoebe as well. I mean, they mentioned in the very first movie that Egon almost tried to drill a hole in his head until Peter stopped him. So it definitely fits with the lore. But something I didn't understand is if Phoebe is is benched from being a Ghostbuster, why did she not get in trouble for what happened at the diner? Well, I mean, she was still even wearing the the flight suit when Carrie Coon almost caught her with with Melody in the basement. So I didn't really understand that. Um, but a little fun fact here, Hasbro actually released a run of 1,200 uh, Afterlife Proton Packs a year or so ago worldwide. I was lucky enough to get in on that run. Well, now those packs are all screen accurate because they they actually bought a bunch from Hasbro to use in this movie, you know, instead of rebuilding them all. So if you have had one and you're listening, didn't know that, there you go. Can't hide money. Whoa. Um, I love how Phoebe is bummed out about, you know, being left behind, but she says, fuck it. We ball. It takes podcasts when she gets a call. Like that's very typical teenage rebellion. Yeah. Uh, I like how the ghosts react when Lars and Lucky are trying to extract the ghost from the devil's testicle, which great name, <laughs> great name. Uh, the chair was banging on the glass, trying to warn Lars. And then the other one in the cell backed away from the window. Like it was scared. Great shit there. Also, I like how Phoebe froze when she saw Melody. Like, that's a great way to show how unready she was for being a Ghostbuster. So it just adds to her story. She knew Melody, so she let emotions get in the way of her doing the job. Yeah. Uh, and then I said it on the instant reaction. I've said it already on here, but it bears repeating again. McKenna Grace is a budding star. She kills the movie. Her awkwardness, her emotions, her line delivery. She has crushed it. I love her. Yeah. And then uh, a great added layer that Melody is using Phoebe. I really like that a lot. So I'm all in. All right, Tre- Trevor sets up a Cheeto trap to catch a Slimer in the attic. Slimer emerges and Trevor fails to trap the ghost as the house shakes violently. Mama tells Phoebe to go to the basement where they see all the damage. We're back in the lab and Lars speaks on the orb and shows them how the other ghosts are acting peculiar around the orb. The proton fields freeze over and Trevor asks where they got it from. Trevor, Lucky, and Lars go to Nadim's house and he lets them in once they say they're not looking for a refund. He lets them in and tries to sell them shoes and other stuff in his house. He takes him to a secret room where they make all kinds of sex dungeon jokes. The room is covered in brass and there's armor everywhere. The room is completely soundproof. 
Lucky takes a reading of Nadine and tells him he's coming with them. Phoebe and Ray are at the shop, are at his shop, and she asks him if he's ever wondered what it's like being a ghost. Podcast shows Ray and Phoebe the video he took of the orb. They don't recognize the language. Ray takes off on his Ecto C motorcycle with the two. Peter Vinkman examines Nadine to ensure he's not possessed by a cross dimensional beast. He begins to ask Nadine questions and he throws pins at him, and Vinkman notices the fire by, behind him react. Peter and the others are amazed at the reaction of the fire when Nadine grows frustrated. Ray makes it past the resistance into the library and speaks to a professor who says the language has been dead for a thousand years. Hubert is in shock seeing the picture of the orb. He takes him to the real library below. They see the orb in ancient carvings. Hubert tells him of an ancient god called Garaka and tells his story. Garaka channels fear into a weapon, the death chill. Ray fearfully tells them how you die. Hubert tells them of the fire masters who captured Garaka in a brass orb. Hubert plays them the chant that opened the orb. Something goes wrong, and the possessor takes the chant fleeing away. They chase after the trash bag through the library. We're outside now, and Hubert finds the bag on a lion, on a lion statue. The statue roars at Ray, and he orders them to press the button on the motorcycle. The lion is alive now, roaring at Ray. Phoebe zaps the lion's tail off, but loses power. The lion leaps at them, but she zaps it in time as the police arrive. They yell for them to put their hands up. All right, Brian, so next set of scenes, what do you think? So, you know, I love this thread that we have here with Trevor attempting to catch Slimer. I mentioned it when we did the Ghostbusters 2 review, but there was an entire subplot that was deleted scenes there where we, you know, which also took place in the firehouse. That was a running gag with Lois Tully, Rick Moranis, trying to catch Slimer on several occasions, but kept failing, trying to bait him with food just like this. So I'm glad that they finally were able to get that into a Ghostbusters movie after all these years. I just, I miss Rick Moranis, though, if I'm being honest. The scene back at Nadim's apartment, absolute just comedy gold. He steals every scene yeah. that he's in, cracked yep. me up. I thought of Nico with the whole sneaker reseller thing. Just picture him asking if they could squeeze, can you squeeze into an eight? I don't know, it cracked me up. But, <laughs> but also Finn Wolfhard and, and Celeste O'Connell just they play so well off of each other. The sex jokes, it was, it was hilarious to me. Um, them putting the same colander brain thing on uh, Nadim. Uh, that they did in Lewis Tully in the first one. Great call back. And he and Murray, I thought, were fantastic going back and forth. I wonder how much of that was ad-libbed. I don't know. But, you know, Bill Murray, you never know. Um, puppies, love them or kill them. That, that was very easy. I don't know. It was just fantastic. I loved it. Uh, and I mentioned this in the instant reaction, but the guy who tells Ray that he's forbidden from coming in the library – that's John Rothman. That's the same guy from the very first one where they're interviewing the librarian who was scared by the ghost. And Vegman asks if she was menstruating at the moment. And he goes, what does that have to do with it? Another just awesome Easter egg. Uh, also on the sign to the library, you can see Dana Barrett's name set to perform as well. So another another awesome Easter egg to Sigourney Weaver and, and Dana there. Now, the possessor ghost thing here maybe came across a little cheesy to me. I mean, it, it was the it was the garbage bag thing for me. But seeing the library ghost again from the first one and Oswald Patton, like you mentioned, it was very much so balanced out enough that it was fine. Pat, Pat, uh, Patton Oswald. What, what did I you say? Said it back. Oswald, Oswald Patton. Oswald Cobblepot. <laughs> My bad. Yeah. Patton Oswald. <laughs> it was very much so b balanced out enough that it was fine. You know, the effects with the Garaka story on the tablet, the lion statue, I, I also thought were absolutely phenomenal. So I like the continual cat and mouse game between Trevor and Slimer. Uh, I thought it was very entertaining and a great way to keep Slimer in our minds for his eventual heroics. Uh, also love how Nadim says the money's gone, but then he welcomed them in when Laura says they weren't looking for a refund. The whole apartment scene is just great. Like I said, he's fantastic. Great comedic addition and in an already funny movie. Uh, finally, almost an hour into the movie, we finally get Peter Vinkman. One of my biggest gripes in this whole movie is how little screen time Bill Murray gets. Like, we need more. And his interaction with Nanjani was great. Also, I love the flames flaring when his emotions rose. That was a great, uh, you know, way to a more obvious way to foreshadow what's going to happen. Um I laughed my ass off when Ray just said, good to see you, buddy, and walked in when he was told he was banned from the library. That fucking, that cracked me up. <laughs> uh, I laughed again when he said, a better question is what's inside of it? What's inside of it? Excellent question. Probably sand. I thought that shit was funny as well. Pat Oswald was a great <laughs> addition as well. Uh, they do a good job of giving us the backstory of Garaka here and making us care and understanding the severity of the situation. 
I think the lion being possessed at the uh, by the possessor was great. I think it looked great and it was an awesome choice. Um, but I do have issues with that scene coming up that I'll get into. But overall, man, I was so entertained by this. I laughed more in this set of scenes than probably the rest of the movie. Our Winston is scolding Phoebe over zapping the lion. The mayor arrives infuriated. He tells them the Ghostbusters are finished. Phoebe snaps saying he opened another dimension last time he tried to shut them down. Phoebe is taken out of handcuffs after not choosing to behave. Callie and Gary scold Phoebe, who is pissed. She storms away from them. Ray and Winston are arguing. Winston says they're too old for this. Winston says, go take a vacation. Ray says this is how he wants to spend his golden years. This is what I love. But Winston tells him to find new ways for the things he loves before it kills him. Callie has Phoebe pick the lock on the door, and they realize all their stuff is gone. Nadine is thrilled seeing the fire move. Gary says they can't leave. He wants to fight for this place. He asks, if something strange is in the neighborhood, who are they going to call? He says this is their home. Nadine goes to the vault amazed by the damage. Ray explains the orb's history and tells Nadine he's next in line. He fires up the lighter and tells him to light the candle. Nadine is amazed seeing the flame move with the movement of his hand. Nadine seems a bit overwhelmed, saying, I think we're all going to die. Gary knocks on Phoebe's door to no answer. We see she's at the park trying to play chess. Gary gives his spill on family. Phoebe and Melody are walking, and she says it sucks. The only one who gets her is a ghost. She tells Melody there's a way for her to be a ghost for a moment. It's not lethal. The two make it to the lab, and she enters a machine that will separate her spirit from her body for two minutes. The machine shuts down after her spirit is extracted, and the countdown starts. The two ghosts are on screen, and Melody is crying. I'm sorry, she says. Garaka controls Phoebe and speaks in the ancient language. Melody betrayed Phoebe so she could see her family again as the orb falls apart. We see a black cloud flee from the orb. Garaka tells Phoebe her world will shatter. My empire will rise. Phoebe comes to, and Lucky tries to capture Garaka to no success. She can't move, and Garaka disappears. Uh, all right, so yeah, you kind of touched on it a little bit already, Dustin, but it drives me crazy with all of these witnesses, and they still act like they didn't just see the lion come to fucking yeah. life. Like I kind, yeah. I kind of explain it away. Uh, with Peck being the mayor and being able to like shut people up. But I wish that there had been a little line somewhere about him, maybe telling the police chief to bury it or something, you know, just for his, you know, evil agenda or whatever, but just so we know what happened, but just a little nitpick there. I do agree with that. Um, I do love the little exchange between Ray and Winston as well. You know, Ray kind of holding on to something that even Winston has maybe moved on from quick, but very powerful scene given, you know, we've all these 40 years of history that we have here with them. And then right into that scene between Callie and Paul Rudd, like it was in the trailer and I wish it hadn't been, but where he's just quoting that Ray Parker Jr. song as normal conversation and she shuts him down. Just such a funny scene. I love it so much. Uh, Another little great touch. There's a subtle continuity nod with the firehouse. You can see in this set of scenes really well, if you pay close attention, there's actually large patches uh, of repairs, of course, corresponding with the location of the basement and the repairs that they had to do after the containment unit exploded in the first movie. So thanks to Peck turning the power off. So awesome little Easter egg there. Very cool effects as Phoebe crosses over to the other dimensional plane too. I mean, when she's taken over by Baraka, her eyes immediately turn creepy as hell looking. Uh, I kind of hate how, you know, Phoebe is pretty much the catalyst for the last two movies even happening. Like they're pretty much all her fault, but I love McKenna Grace. So I'll forgive it. You know, something else in the trailer that was cut originally lucky was going to die here or at least be frozen to death temporarily. Like, you know, everyone else, because there's this great shot in the trailer that shows her tear ducts freezing over here with, with Ray telling the Garaka story. So I'm kind of glad that they didn't kill her just because I mean, Lucky only gets to participate in the end really here after this. And and she was kind of sidelined a little bit in the last movie. Most, you know, so most of all, I'm kind of glad that they, they didn't do that because of that reason. So, yeah, I mean, here's what I don't get. Why would Winston and the mayor be blaming Phoebe? There were plenty of witnesses, including cops who saw the yeah. damn concrete lion become alive and charge at her. Like that makes no sense. So I agree. Uh, Gary stepping up and being stern with Phoebe was great. Very well done because even when he did it, he was unsure of himself afterwards. And, uh, you know, I thought that Callie had a great sucks, doesn't it? Like that to me was very realistic. Uh, but even better than that was when he asked Callie, you know, like you said, if there's something strange in the neighborhood, who are they going to call? That's just great stuff. I laugh every time, especially when he says 
Bustin feels good. And she says, no, get out like that. That was, that was great. Uh, also love the whole light the candle scene, particularly how Ray keeps saying, light the candle. I like the candle. Like that shit was so funny. It's like, just do it. Uh, I think, I think Dan Aykroyd's awesome. Uh, but here's something I'll ask y'all. This is the question. You think Phoebe's relationship with Melody was platonic or do you think there was, uh, you know, maybe some lady love feelings afoot? Because I've seen both theories supported online yeah. and even Emily Allen Lynn said it was never spelled out in either direction to the cast. I definitely felt like there were some googly eyes, though. What do you guys think? I, I didn't take it as that. I just took it as two two kids being friends, really. And like I, okay. I, like I said, I, I know Gil did that on purpose and made it obscure and didn't tell the cast members that because he wanted it to just come out platonically like it's supposed to. So, uh, But I, I took them as just friends. Okay. Same, just friends. Okay. I just, you know, when they're walking down the sidewalk, the way that Phoebe looks at her is the only thing that made me question it. But anyway. Definitely could have been. I mean. Yeah. But when Melody tricks Phoebe, that, that's grounds for a breakup, though. Dirty move, freeing Garaka like that. Fuck no, relationship over. Uh, then a major oh shit moment when Garaka froze Lucky's proton pack. Like, that's gr- great dramatic moment to build for our final showdown. So I'm ready to see how we wrap it up. All right, they make it to the lab, and Lucky tells Callie and Gary what happened. Lars realizes the spirit has escaped the orb and confirms they're in big trouble. Garaka enters a smoke shop, freezing the worker who says he is the fire master. Hate to see you. You should have kept your mouth shut, brother. Garaka breaks into Nadim's apartment and gets his horns from the hidden room. Nice normal day on the beach until suddenly the carnival rides stop, and they see a giant cloud over the ocean. Panic ensues when icicles fall from the sky. Phoebe says she feels stupid. Gary says it's okay to feel stupid. Callie asks she's ready to be a Spengler again. They need her. Ray asks how Garaka got out. He's coming for the containment unit to have an army of ghosts. Podcast says, fear not. We have the fire master who shows them how he lights a candle with his powers. Gary isn't impressed, asking where the proton packs are. They all get suited up, and Phoebe asks about brass. She melts down brass to coat the the components of her pack to give them a chance. Winston shows up and suits up. Let's get to work. Knock at the door, and it's Vinkman. He tells Janine she looks sporty in uniform and takes a swig of liquid courage. Ray tells them it's Possessor using the tricycle and are told to come down to safety. The doors are pulled off the hinges, and Possessor takes over the ectomobile. Lars looks around the place and sees the potato-looking ghost who rolls towards him, spitting slime all over him. Lucky is taken over, and Trevor is almost zapped until Gary pushes him, and Nadine controls the energy, forcing it out the window. Podcast hammers the possessed pack, and Slimer eats the possessed pizza. And the next set of scenes are the ending. What would you think, Brian? The the effects on Garaka finding his horn, killing the first Firemaster cigarette salesman, that whole thing, just amazing. Very reminiscent of the original Are You Keymaster scene from the original. But the whole scene with basically New York being frozen, starting with everyone on the beach. You know, this was in the trailer too, but it was set in the trailer to Bananarama's Cruel Summer. And I'm going to be honest, it was it was better. Like I wanted that song playing there too and to have it abruptly cut off like it did in the trailer. I, I missed it. Like I thought that was really good. Uh, but again, the effects were awesome. I almost wish that we would have spent more time in this whole frozen New York hellscape, but I know the movie is already two hours long. Uh, but it was very cool to see Annie Potts and McKenna Grace share the screen once again. Both were in Young Sheldon. Love that show. Uh, it was pretty cool to me anyway. Seeing Janine suit up, something I've always wanted to see since they did it a few times in the cartoon. Uh, very cool. A special shot to me anyway. Another little Easter egg when they're suiting up. You can actually see Ray's Ghostbusters 2 suit in his locker. And fun fact, that's actually a fan suit. They reached out to the guys over at Yes Have Some Podcast. You know, I've been known to listen to them from time to time. And they asked them to use their Ghostbusters 2 flight suit for the movie. The guy was super pumped to now have a screen-used flight suit. So, I don't know. Sorry, nerd facts there. Um, I, thought that, I thought you were going to tell us that was your suit, and I was not going to yeah. be surprised at all. <laughs> I would have told you guys that before. But uh, Vankman showing up to suit up, man. Murray is only in this for like two seconds, and I know that they did cut a few scenes with he and Paul Rudd just shooting the shit, which I loved, but I do understand the runtime and them needing to cut them. But when he comes on the screen, he just he takes over every time. And we say that with every movie that we do, Zombieland, no matter what he's in and who he's in the scene with, he takes it over uh now the scene on the road with the possessor ghost inside the tricycle on that dark road started to get a little bit 
more scary, a little bit into the scary territory. I like that. I wish you would have gotten more of that, honestly, and less of the garbage bags walking around in the pukey ghost. Okay. So first of all, the shots of the cold front rolling in and New York freezing were great. Fantastic. But I didn't really care for the effects on Garaka's horns when they were untwisting and straightening out. Like to me, they look very stop motion ish. Like, I don't know. They they just didn't look the best to me. They didn't look consistent with the rest of the movie. Um, I love podcasts and Nadim's excitement over the candle thing. And then everyone else still being highly concerned. That was funny. Cause like, imagine you're like, Hey, I finally did it. And everyone else is like, we're still fucked like this. Okay, cool. Like uh, I thought they nailed that. There is an error here though. Phoebe melts brass to plate, uh, to plate parts of her proton pack in the movie. But to do this, she puts brass in a cast iron pot and melts it with a propane torch. It can melt brass that way, but it would take significantly longer to melt that amount of brass. And it would be nearly impossible to keep in liquid form for more than a few seconds. So that's a mess. But also, as the brass melts, it glows orange. However, uh, brass glows green when it's melting due to the copper and zinc elements that make up the composition. Uh, And then lastly, molten zinc releases poisonous zinc oxide fumes and zinc should never be melted indoors without an exhaust hood and without wearing gas mask. So there's an error there, science nerds. But um, other than that, it was fine. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Thank God Vinkman is back here. Like I said, we need way more Bill Murray in this one and his hidden liquor bottle trick. That was hilarious. A hundred percent something I would do. Like, you know, if I spent so much time in this place, and, uh, you know, I would have a, a liquor stash. So that was funny. Uh, I liked that Janine, like you said, Brian, I liked that she finally puts on the jumpsuit, something she didn't do in the first two movies, but did in the real Ghostbusters cartoon. Fantastic. Uh, the possessor getting into the pizza and then getting eaten by Slimer. Fucking awesome. This movie rules, man. Like, I was so fired up when Slimer, that's what I meant earlier. Like, Slimer's still in the back of my mind. Slimer's still around. So I liked that they showed us the Cheeto trap and everything. And then, boom, he's, he saves the day, kind of. So I'm excited for the finish here. All righty. Here's the ending. The Rose and Firehouse freeze up and Melody is outside the vault. Phoebe asked if any of it was real. She says she did beat her at chess. She says she never wanted to hurt her. She just wanted to see her family. It's too late. Garaka is here. Callie calls out for Phoebe and Vinkman says, heads up, tall, dark, and horny at 12 o'clock. Garaka enters and they all shoot him with their proton packs to no success. Nadine fails to slide down the fire pole in his armor and says he's his worst nightmare. He tries to bargain, but to no success. You are no fire master. Nadine tries to fire up the lighter, but it's out of fluid. Vinkman is proud Ray quit smoking in the 90s, and he's still proud of him now. Garaka traps them all with icicles, and a beam of red energy explodes into the sky. Ghosts fly all over the city, and Phoebe stands up seeing all the flashing lights. She runs upstairs and zaps Garaka with her pack. The energy goes back into the ground as the two combat. Her pack shuts down as she freezes over. Garaka reaches for her until Melody lights a match that flows to Nadine, who Kamehameha's Garaka with the fire. That's a Dragon Ball Z reference. Her pack is back on. The, <laughs> her pack is back on. She shoots Garaka simultaneously. Her family joins her, and Podcast tries to trap him, but is attacked by the Marshmallow guys. The drone crashes, and Ray resets the vault. They all join in to close the lever, which traps Garaka below. When the light is green, the whole world is clean. Phoebe and Melody reconnect. She hands her the matchbook and disappears. She hugs her mom and the world thaws out. Crowds form, chanting for the Ghostbusters as they emerge. Cops arrive and the mayor tries to condemn them, but the crowd chants their support for the Ghostbusters. Winston sings Phoebe's praise for all to hear. He yells they are the Ghostbusters to the crowd's cheer. The theme plays as they all sign autographs and take pictures. Hell's Kitchen Dragon chases the Slimer. Phoebe calls Phoebe calls Gary dad and they all go to chase after the ghost. They let Trevor drive this time, but he has to look both ways. For Ivan, as credits roll. Then we get a mid credit scene that shows a truck driver trying to use a vending machine, but the many puff stay, but the many stay puff men drive away with the stay puff truck. All right, Brian, that's the ending. What'd you think? What a great moment, you know, with Phoebe calling Gary dad. I thought that was just, it was very good. Quick and powerful, effective. And, you know, I did. And it was, just com- as, it was just as awkward as it would have been in real life. Like, she's like, yeah. uh, I've never called you dad before. And he was like, did he just, yeah, that was great. Yeah, they're great acting there. Um, I hear the complaints of it seeming like it was rushed with the big bad. But, I mean, if you go back and look at the other Ghostbusters movies, one with Gozer, two with Vigo, we had the same exact formula. You know, build up to the villain the entire movie, really 
for the villain to only be on the screen for the very last act. And, you know, so I didn't really have any issues with it. I thought it was perfectly fine. (laughs) You said it, Nico, tall, dark and horny at 12 o'clock. Great great fucking line. Like it is just, it's so great. I almost wish that wasn't in the trailer either. Or you know what? We'll just fix all that. I would quick watch and fucking trailers. That's what I need to do. Boom. You're right, man. You're right. That'll, it'll just leave Nico and Mike to do any trailer reactions though. But (laughs) you know, Hey, uh, great effects on the final scene and the whole final fight. Admittedly, a little too much joking around. I do agree with Nico on that. Um, the, the going down the fire pole, that was the one thing where I thought, eh, they went a little bit too far with that one. Um, but overall, fantastic. I love the Easter eggs after the fight with the press. Someone yelling at the mayor, calling him Dickless. Awesome callback to Vankman calling him Dickless in the original one. Also, someone in the crowd waving baby blue Ghostbusters shirts. Another callback to the original. I've never seen those shirts anywhere except for that crowd scene in the original 84 movie at the end. So I've always wanted one. And now, if you'll remember in Afterlife, in the last one, one of the nitpicks I had was how the mid credit scene with Sigourney Weaver and Bill Murray should have been in the movie and not a mid credit scene. This one, nah. It's stupid. I wasn't a fan of it at all. I, you know, had no desire to even see that part. All right. So I know one thing. If I'm Phoebe and I walk down the stairs and I see Melanie's bitch ass, I shoot first, ask questions later. I would not hesitate. She fucked the whole thing. Uh, then Nadine, great comedic relief again. I disagree with you guys. The way he slid down the pole and then his dialogue, that was hilarious to me. Maybe maybe I'm being biased because I love uh, Camille so much, but I liked it. Um, big time oh shit moment when all the ghosts are freed. Great drama for the finish. I love that Nadine finally got his shit figured out and got to be a big part in being a hero. Look, the ending is what it is. I said it on the instant reaction. We know the Ghostbuster formula. A badass ghost rolls into town. The baby faces go over one, two, three. You can't be mad at that. The fun in this franchise is what happens between the open and the meaning, uh, the open and the ending. And then uh, when the girl snapped a selfie with podcasts, when, you know, they're being heralded as heroes and kissed him on the cheek. My first thought was, well, his parents are now going to know that he's not a space camp. So he's fucked. Yeah. Uh, true. I like that the movie ends with the, the Hell's Kitchen sewer dragon on the loose again. Shows that there will always be ghosts that need busted. And maybe we'll get more and more sequels. I'm usually anti-sequel. But not in this case. Uh, and then, you know, I, the mid credit scene, I didn't see it before we did this. I left in the theaters when the credits started rolling, as I normally do, unless I know there's a mid or end credit scene. Uh, big time Maximum Overdrive vibes. Hell yeah. I saw a tra- uh, semi <laughs> crank up, start driving on its own. I was like, hell yeah, baby. Let's let's tie those franchises <laughs> together. But, uh, oh, it was just a Stay puff Mini Marshmallows. It was still a lot of fun. It didn't really do anything. It was you know very yeah. quick and had no point, but it was fun. I, I liked the ending. I liked the whole movie. Yeah. All right, guys, on our social media comments and questions, uh, we don't have anything on the gram this week. Uh, Dustin, you got X pulled up? I do. Wait, you're talking about the social media site, right? Not like X videos. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Damn. We got a we got a handful on the artist formerly known as Twitter. Anita Russell said, not as good as the first one, but still a solid addition to the franchise. My question to that would be, do you mean the first one as in Ghostbusters original or the first one as in the first one in this reboot? So either way, I appreciate your comment. Uh, Mookie said... The only problem with the new Ghostbusters in general is the same problem with the new Scream movies and Evil Dead Rise have, in my opinion. The new Ghostbusters don't feel like a Ghostbusters movie. Still really good, and I hope they keep making more. Okay, it's fair. Uh, Sean? That's that's why I like the new Evil Dead movies, because they don't feel like the old ones. (laughs) That's true. Uh, Sean the Glee Man, our friend Sean Irwin, said, I really like this movie. Wish there had been a bit more of the bad guy, but after what we uh, but what we got was fun and a good follow up to Afterlife. I agree. Randy Smith, Go Dogs, said a solid solid movie, way better than the 2016 movie. I know Brian Shut disagrees up. with that. Doesn't even doesn't even exist. <laughs> and then Eric, friend of the show, Eric Knowles and Finn said, "Let's go, good job, B Hath." So he's excited to hear this movie. I'm taking it. He liked the movie. I'll do Facebook Book of Faces. 
Cheyenne Turner commented, this movie had way too many characters, but still better than the 2016 one. And of course, always good to see that sweet angel baby, Paul Rudd and Bill Murray. Sweet angel baby. <laughs> All right, then. Sounds, yeah. sounds like me when I talk about Emma Roberts. That's funny. Facts. All right. Uh, y'all got any fun facts you want to share? No, first of all, do people not realize that the 2016 Ghostbusters is not in this continuity, like at all? Do they not realize that it's by itself because it's a remake? People really think that that's like part of this franchise. Like, really well, brother, you can address that when I pick it and we review it. That's fine. Hey, you already gave me my my terms and my conditions, and I agreed. So, buckle up. First one is on one of the shelves in Ray's Occult. There is a glass skull bottle, which is a nod to Dan Aykroyd, who actually conceived and created Crystal Head Vodka. Fun fact, I have one of those Crystal Head Vodka bottles in my house. Oh, it's shit. empty. Nice. Um, I bought it. So I went on this kick where I was just wanting to try different vodkas and whiskeys that I'd never tried. And I went to my local liquor store here and I saw it. I thought, that's a really cool bottle. So even if it sucks, that's a cool bottle to have. I get right. it. I get home and I see on the box Dan Aykroyd's name. And in my mind, I'm like, it's got to be a different Dan Aykroyd. I would have heard about this if this was the Dan Aykroyd. Lo and behold, it's the Dan Aykroyd. So I thought it was really cool they included that in this movie. Um, Gil Keenan confirmed that the late Ivan Reitman was made aware of the plans for the film before his death in February of 22, uh, which is three months before the sequel was officially announced by Sony. Uh, Keenan and Jason Reitman walked the franchise's original director through their complete pitch, and he gave their approval. So that's really cool to know that he, you know, signed off on it and gave his stamp of approval. And then the last one that I have, Brian, you and I mentioned that we want, or maybe I'd mentioned it. I don't remember, but uh, Rick Moranis, we wanted Lewis Tolley to make a return. Well, in an interview with THR, director Gil Keenan revealed that neither Rick Moranis nor Sigourney Weaver were in the film as Lewis and Tully or Lewis Tully and Dana Barrett, respectively. He confirmed that the two were never even approached for possible cameos that their, as their characters weren't needed for the story. Bummer. I also saw that Rick Moranis uh, wouldn't have done it anyway because he apparently retired from acting in the late 90s and has no interest. But come on, man. You're fucking Rick Moranis. You gave us Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and that whole franchise. You gave us Little Giants. You gave us Ghostbusters. You gave us Little, Hop of Sh- Little Shop of Horrors. Just make one fucking cameo in this to appease my nostalgia. Go ahead. <laughs> you know it's serious if Dustin wants something for nostalgia. Yeah, you're right. I, nostalgia doesn't mean shit to me, but when it does, it does, damn it. $100 million estimated budget, May $200 million, but it just went back to number one on streaming this past weekend, so they're making a killing on DVDs, Blu-rays, and streaming, so hopefully they'll make another one. I think they'll make another Hell one. Yeah. That's, if you're making $100 million, they're going to make another one, by God. Yeah, I mean, if, if the Strangers chapter two is getting made, you might as well make another Ghostbusters movie. You know what I'm saying? Uh, right. Don't get me started on that one. <laughs> All right, let's jump into our favorite ghost, least favorite ghosts in our rating. That was a good idea, Dustin. I like that. It, it was. Yeah, I that. Ghost, I'm going to go with Garaka just because I thought Garaka was cool. Least favorite ghost. I'm going to go with, this might be Blasphemous, but I'm going to go with Slimer just because I feel like it didn't serve a point in this one. Whoa. Hey, is this favorite ghost, least favorite ghost of the franchise or this movie? Just this movie, movie, I believe. I assume we still gotta movie. do we still gotta do twenty sixteen and then we can do the whole franchise. I'm not playing around about this twenty sixteen thing. Fucking I'm not asshole. either. You gave me my terms and I agreed. You know, I'm gonna change my mind from Slimer. I'm gonna I'm gonna say possessor. I'll say possessor. Hopefully that redeems any kind of points from me. Uh, hey, no, none of us none of us said it, but speaking of possessor, the uh when it possessed the trash bag, that was all done practically. So I think that's cool. That's really cool. That's crazy. I didn't know that, honestly. Yeah, that's cool. Yep. All right. So I already kind of said this wasn't my favorite personally. I thought it was well made and acted. I just thought there was too much going on. And maybe just as not a diehard, I didn't understand everything going on. Uh, I really enjoyed the moments with the OG cast. Like, I'm not even a diehard. And I still got like, like I mentioned in, in Afterlife, I got the goose pimples. Like, you've. They just have a charm about them that I really like and appreciate. And Bill Murray, of course, we just covered him in Zombieland. He's awesome. He's always a delight to see on the big screen. Mm-hmm. But I just thought there was too much going on and a lot of character choices that just didn't work for me. And I, I hope I'm not hated, but I gave it a five. <coughs> okay. I'll go ahead and go to make up for that. 
Favorite ghost for me was Slimer, you asshole. And I get it. <laughs> Slimer didn't play a, a big part in this movie, but, and I said it a minute ago, when nostalgia hits for me, it hits. And so reintroducing Slimer was awesome to me. I think it, I think the effects on it, like he looked, it was a great model, looked great. And it was cool that it was introduced early and we were like, ah, how's he going to tie in? Well, what's it going to matter? He ended up kind of saving the day, taking care of the possessor. So I thought that was good. Least favorite ghost for me was the little potato fuck. Like, didn't really serve a purpose. <laughs> Just kind of rolled on the screen and puked. And it's like, ah, oh, that's stupid. So uh, potato fuck was my least favorite. Uh, as for my final thoughts in the rating, look, there's a scene in Harold and Kumar Escape Guantanamo Bay where someone's portraying George W. Bush. And he goes, yeah, well, that makes you a fucking hypocriticizer, too. I guess I'm a hypocriticizer. I know what I've said about my hunger for original content, and I want Hollywood to stop milking franchises dry, but there are exceptions. I'm all for Ghostbusters and the brand of Ghostbusters to get a Fast and Furious-like run. Give me 10, 11 of these fucking movies. They're fun as hell, and this one isn't without its flaws, but it's fun nonetheless. I gave it an eight and a quarter. Nice. Okay, so to avoid having the same favorite and least favorite ghost as... As Dustin, my favorite ghost instead of Slimer, I'm going to go with in the lab. There's that scary, like skull looking face ghost that kind of mm. like backs away and comes back. That was yeah. a badass looking ghost. Anyway, least favorite ghost. Same as you, pukey in this one. I'm sorry. I just, I don't like it at all. And okay. So since I ran my mouth so much about this movie, I want to just kind of say where I want to see the the franchise go from here. So with all the ghosts, you know, being released here, I mean, you can really do whatever you want. Gil Keenan and Jason Reitman. I mean, the, the franchise is in good hands with them. They said they already have an idea for the next one. I kind of want to stick to what I said in the instant reaction. I want to see it go to the UK, you know, have them on vacation or something, have them go investigate some old castle over there. I guess that, that just sound a little bit Scooby Dooey, but Scooby Dooish. But um, sounds good to me. I think it would be really cool. Anyway, I gave the original a 10. I gave uh, Ghostbusters 2 a 9.5. I gave Afterlife a 9.75. <laughs> They're all right there together. Like these are elite no matter where I rank them in the, in the four. Uh, I'm giving this one a, a 9.5. Another fantastic job, I think, from everyone involved. All right. So with Nico's fucking five, that puts us at a <laughs> – I put it at a seven point five eight three 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 repeating bar for our composite score. IMDb has it as six point uh, six point one, so we're higher than them. But Rotten Tomatoes, get your shit together, critics. They got it at forty two percent. Yeah, the critics, Good, yeah. fuck them. I don't think that Nico would would, in retrospect, rate the eighty four Ghostbusters a six again. I think that if you watch it again, you'd go higher. I agree. I'll watch it again. I commit. To, I'm committing to that. I'm gonna watch it again. Uh, y'all got any final thoughts before I just shout out the Blood Donors and I'll shout out Mike's pick for next week? All right, Blood Donors. We got a new legendary Blood Donor, Dana Tucker. Really appreciate you. Really appreciate you. Camper level reoccurring, Nina, Michelle Mirza, the Horror Movie Crew Podcast, Alex Seligson, Michael Evans, Steve Schmidt, and Max K. Camp Council reoccurring, Edwin Hernandez Gunn, Joe Swinford, Shan, Adrian Aiello, Brian Samick, Andrew Ferguson, Matt Strickland, Brooke Maley, Thorne David Phillips, Heather Superduck, Jennifer Davis from the Too Close to Home podcast, Dana Tucker, and Cole McAlexander. We really appreciate y'all. And like I mentioned last week, I believe, a lot of names have been on that list for a long time, so it means a lot to us. Really appreciate yeah, it. Absolutely. Every time you say Joe, Joe Swinford, I think Samson I was way I'm off. Not, dude, <laughs> and that's so funny because that was on the Ghostbusters uh, Frozen Empire instant reaction that yeah. I said that. <laughs> we, were, right. we were both like, what's her new listing? Fuck. <laughs> Shout out to Joe. <laughs> Swammy, Schwammy, uh, <laughs> Samsonite. No, I uh, really appreciate all of our blood donors. Uh, this is a free month. Brian picked it. Uh, Mike's not here. He's um doing stuff in the Daytona on the 4th of July weekend. Live it up. Uh, that's what rich people do. We're all, yep. you know, had to work today. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, but his choice is Freaky from 2020, I believe. I watched that movie Hell, the other day. Yeah. It's fun. It's a good time. Yeah, I think everyone Hell, will yeah. like that one. Yeah, A lot more it's brutal. Fun. A lot more brutal yeah. than I thought it would be, honestly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vince Vaughn's great in it. And Catherine Newton, I'm a beat Mike to the punch. Call me sometime. Just check your DMs. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> uh, really appreciate everyone who listened. I hope Brian doesn't hate me, but still love you, brother. Uh, we'll be back next week with Freaky. 
Take that how you will. Just want to remind everybody. 